Tracing is a powerful debugging technique that shows you all of the operations that happened during a certain operation flow and also how long they took. The distributed aspect of it is when you're tracing across multiple services, for example, like a client for a browser or a mobile app or an API handler or even a cron job. Distributed tracing is especially useful for debugging distributed backends like serverless or microservices, because in those cases, logs will not give you the full picture. So let's see how they work. So this is a standard trace view of an update flashcards operation. As we can see from the chart itself, we have a lot of different operations. For example, db.prisma, user find unique, or http.client, put on a specific endpoint, or a simple function, or even a cache, mutating SW cache, etc. Each of these things are called spans. And spans are basically the smallest unit of work. So in some way, tracing, using spans as a tool, tries to replicate how our console log messages look like, or the structure of our project. As we can see, if we read this from top to bottom, first we have a mark span, making the API requests, which has no length in time, which is pretty much just an ordinary log message. Then we have an HTTP client span that wraps around the fetch functionality, which executes a put HTTP requests on this specific endpoint. Within itself, it has an HTTP.server, which means now this subtree of spans uh, happen on the server side, not on the client. Of course, it contains db.prisma spans or types of spans for finding the user or the category. Then there's a function for checking uh, the results from the database, etc. Then it goes back to the browser or the client and invalidates the cache, executes two more HTTP requests, and then it serializes the response. Imagine that these were still just ordinary console.log messages. In order to see this level of detail in the operation flow, we would need to somehow consolidate the client console.log messages with the server console.log messages and put them in the exact order. And then we would see how the operation flow went operation by operation. But what we wouldn't be able to see from log messages is how long each of those requests or spans took. So for example, in our case, looking at the update flashcard operation, if we know or suspect that it's taking a bit longer, then we know where to look. Because we know that the put request took 624 milliseconds, the mutating cache took 215 milliseconds. So if there's an opportunity to optimize or if there's a performance bottleneck, then we would know where it is. For example, if we don't anticipate the put request to take 624 milliseconds, then we know to look into it. But in our case, using Sentry, the level of detail doesn't stop there. We can like expand on it and see that the longest operation or the longest span that took place during this whole operation is actually the db.prisma flashcard update span. So yeah, we can see that writing in the database is actually the heaviest operation from this whole operation flow. So let's see how this is implemented. First, let's check out the demo app. The demo app that we have here is a simple flashcards app that has a manage and practice sections. In the manage section, we can update, create, or delete our flashcards and our tracing me mechanism is actually built into the update flashcard. Make an update into the flashcard, hit update, and this is the function or this is the moment where the distributed tracing kicks off. It goes back to the server, it traces all the way to the server and then back to the client and it produces the span tree that we just saw. So let's check out how it's implemented. This file right here is the flashcard hooks file. So basically we're keeping all of the functionality on the client side in React hooks. Here's the update method that we trigger when we click on the update button and the distributed tracing implementation begins here. So first we're getting the scope. 
Think of the scope as this place where you put all of the data that you want to be sent to Sentry's backend. That includes all of the transactions and all of the spans, etc. To obtain the scope, we simply get the current hub, which knows how to send uh, scopes to the Sentry backend and create new ones. And then we simply get the currently running scope. Then we start a new transaction called updating flashcard. And by the way, the Sentry SDK for Next.js specifically knows how to do this automatically. But in this demo, I'm doing all these things manually just to show you how everything works, even under the hood, or if you want to do any custom instrumentation in cases where the SDK does not necessarily update or create uh, instrumentation for you. So this is how we start a new transaction. The transaction is basically the vehicle where we put all of our spans and every, all of the data into it that gets carried away to Sentry. And then we set the current transaction, basically bind it to the current scope. So everything that we append to it gets attached to this transaction. And then we have our first child span, which is the making the API requests span. And we set the operation as a mark. A mark span means this is a span that has no time length. So we immediately invoke the finish method on it. If we don't, it's not going to get attached to the transaction. Therefore, it won't show up in our Sentry dashboard later. Then we define the headers in a record. And if the transaction exists, we append the Sentry dash trace header, which comes from the transaction itself. The to trace parent method will return a string containing uh, three different segments. The transaction, the trace ID, dash the parent span ID, and dash first is the trace ID, followed by the parent span ID. And at the end, we have a value that indicates whether the trace is sampled or not. So that is the sentry trace. This is basically how we take the trace from the client side and move it to the actual backend or whatever service intercepts this. Then we simply make the fetch requests, which Sentry automatically creates another span for it. And we saw that in the dashboard. And along with the headers, our trace is being sent to the backend. So let's check out that file. Here is the Next.js API handler for the update flashcard or just all the flashcards. And we start off by getting the slug and destructuring the body here. We try to get the session and do a check if the user is authorized or not. And we try to get the user object from the session. Again, do a check if it's authorized or not. And then we switch on the actual request method. So if it's a get, that means give me that specific flashcard. But in our case, we only care about the put method, which is our update flashcard method. So let's check this out. First, we get the scope the same way we do it on the client side. But this time, we only get the transaction from the scope instead of creating a new one. Because the Sentry SDK for Next.js will see that there is a Sentry dash trace header and it will create a transaction automatically for us. So in order to continue the trace that we started previously, we should just get the currently running transaction instead of creating a new one. So this way we get the automatically created transaction for us and we can attach spans to it to continue the trace. So let's see. The next operation that we have is the get category by ID, which basically just triggers a find unique Prisma query that tries to get the actual category from the database. And Sentry is smart enough to automatically create a span for us. Then we start off the category checks span. And you can see that we're doing this by transaction.startchild. We give it an operation and then of course the description. Then we perform any of the checks that we want to perform. And based on the criteria, we can set the status to the span. For example, in this case, we're setting this to not found because we couldn't find that category from the database. And we immediately invoke the finish method on it. So it gets attached to the transaction. Or in this case, if the category does not belong to the requesting user, we set the status to unauthenticated. And of course, invoke the finish method. If everything is okay, we simply invoke the finish method without necessarily setting the status because it automatically is being set to okay. Okay, then we have the get flashcard operation, which again just invokes a Prisma query where we find the first flashcard that matches this slug and this user ID. And just like the categories, we start a flashcard check span and do pretty much the same. 
Lastly, and this is the big one, we invoke the update flashcard method, which basically writes all of this body into the database. There we go. Prisma.flashcard.update. And we pass in the data. At the end, we return 200 from the server and the JSON of the updated flashcards. And this takes us back to the client. So let's switch again to the client side. There we go. This is our fetch requests. So now since we got the result, we check if it's okay. Then we start the mutating SWR cache span. And these are the two uh, methods or two mutate invocations to mutate the flashcards span for the slug and the general one. And then we just simply finish the mutating cache span. Then we have the serialized span where we await for the response. Then we have the serialized span where we just await res.json and then we finish the span. And of course, we also finish the transaction, which marks everything as ready to go and it's going to get sent to Sentry's backend so we can view it later. But if the result was not okay, then we create an error span, fail to update the flashcard, we pass in the reason, and then we do the same. Uh, finish the error span and then finish the transaction. And that's what happens when we click the update flashcard button. So let's check it out again. If we go back to the performance tab and scroll all the way down, we're going to see our updating flashcard transaction, the one that we started manually. If we click on that, click on the sampled events, we're going to see all of the events that happened within this updating flashcard transaction. So let's pick out the last one. As you can see, it's at 7.13. And here's the same chart that we saw previously. We can expand on the actual put request. We can see all of the Prisma queries for finding the user, the category. Here are all the category checks spans. There's the DB Prisma flashcard find first again, and there's also the flashcards update query that took the longest. In this case, it was 384 milliseconds. After that ends, the operation goes back to the client side, which invalidates or mutates the cache, and then it serializes the response at the end. So this is distributed tracing. As long as you can create that string called sentry-trace and move it between services, either through the body or through the headers or save it in a database so that a cron job can pick it up later, you can move the trace across different services or basically you can distribute the trace. If you only used logs for complex operations like that, you would have to dig through a lot of log messages to actually understand what's going on. And that's how distributed tracing makes debugging complex or distributed backends very easy. Plus, as a bonus, you get to see any performance bottlenecks that you have in your backend.